Hello, everyone. Welcome to the System of Care Learning Series. My name is Lee Taylor, and I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Our session today is in um, Zoom webinar. That means that all attendees are muted and your videos are off. We are recording the session and it will be available soon. I dropped that link in the chat box and I'll drop it in again later. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen for questions. We should have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. ASL interpreters will be on screen throughout the session. You can change your view at the top portion of your screen. Also, we are using auto captioning this morning, and if you do not see that on your screen, press the CC button. We know that there may be technical difficulties, and we appreciate your patience if we encounter any today. Okay, to be eligible for continuing education credit or certificates of attendance, you must be in the content portion of the webinar for at least 90% of the session to be eligible. This is a mandate by the boards. Please do not leave the webinar until the conclusion of the Q&A as that counts as part of the session. You do not have to enter your contact information in the chat as attendees and their time is tracked by Zoom. You must register for each session and join with the link emailed to you. If you receive the link from a friend or coworker, we will not be able to track your attendance and you will not be eligible for a certificate. And also you must use the same email address to register for each session. That is the unique identifier used to track attendance for continuing education throughout the learning series. By the first full week of December, you'll receive an email from me that will provide a link to access the session evaluation, then your certificate. This is a screenshot to show you the landing page for the evaluations and the certificates. You complete the session evaluation to proceed to the certificate. And lastly, you are responsible for printing your own certificate. We do not mail or email certificates. This website houses several years of the System of Care Academy. So if you lose your certificate, you can access this website to print another. And now let's learn about our presenters. First, we have Don Burke, who is the Trauma System of Care Administrator for Aetna Better Health of Kentucky. She has a master's degree in counseling psychology and has been in the behavioral health field for 34 years in an array of positions, case manager, therapist, unit manager, director of risk management, and vice president of programs. Her, her favorite thing is to provide training, coaching, and consultation across a wide variety of topics, including motivational interviewing, wraparound process, trauma-informed care, and self-care, and person-centered recovery planning. Our next presenter is Latonya Wilson. Latanya is a certified family peer support specialist with Aetna Better Health of Kentucky. In her role, she offers hope, guidance, advocacy, and camaraderie for parents and caregivers of children and youth receiving services for mental health, substance use, and related service systems. Latanya said her favorite part of her job is getting to know children in need and having a positive impact on their lives. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate that introduction, Leah. Um, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, great, thank you so much. And so now I am going to share my screen and get us started. And hope you all can see that. It's great. Yes. Okay, awesome, thank you. So welcome everybody. It's just so exciting to be here and Latanya and I are really thrilled to do this training. As you already heard from Leah, my name is Don Burke and I'm the Trauma System of Care Administrator with Aetna Better Health of Kentucky and the SKY program. And next, I'm just going to let my training partner, my wonderful training partner, Latanya, um, just introduce herself so that you can see her and, and her role as well in the SKY program. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Latanya Wilson. I am a certified family peer support specialist with Aetna Better Health of Kentucky Sky. Um, I support caregivers of Sky members struggling with um, behavioral health challenges, and I'm happy to be here. 
That's wonderful. Thank you so much, LaTanya. As some of you may not know, Kentucky Sky stands for Supporting Kentucky Youth, which is a special Medicaid program run by Aetna for all of those children across Kentucky that have been adopted through our child welfare system, those in kinship care, those that are Medicaid eligible, people who are youth who are in DJJ custody and those children in DCBS custody, including transition age youth. You can see the title of our training is Running on Empty, Self-Care in Times of Despair. And it's wonderful to have you all participate. Um, Latanya and I definitely have a strong mission to help the people who are helping others. Our objectives for today um, what is the importance of self-care for providers or helpers? And please remember in this training, provider or helper can mean a variety of positions such as case manager, community support provider, peer support specialist, a therapist, a medical provider, a DCBS or DJJ worker, a parent or a foster parent, basically anyone who provides care in any way to other people. So what is trauma and how does it impact other people? We will explore adverse childhood experiences during this training. And when working with others, trauma can have a really big impact on their lives and hence the lives of their providers or caregivers. So what are some of the reasons why it's hard to do self-care? That's always um, something that comes up a lot when we're doing training and hopefully we can answer or respond to some of the barriers that people experience and lastly we're going to explore ideas about self-care and strategies and if we have enough time hopefully we can even create some beginning plans that work for each of us as individuals there is no one-size-fits-all approach to self-care and please note, LaTanya and I will talk a lot throughout this presentation of the importance of a no shame, no blame or guilt around anyone's level or style of self-care or lack thereof. This is a judgment-free zone. LaTanya and I are really aware that the journey for self-care is a journey. And sometimes we start with baby steps and we completely understand it because we are also on that journey. And occasionally you step off the path and it takes you a while, you get a little lost until you find your way again. And that's okay. We totally get it. How about a warm up? What is one thing you really enjoy doing? Please put your answers in the chat. Um, it may not be something you are able to do right now for a variety of reasons. Don't overthink it. Just the first thing that comes to mind. Put your answers in the chat. Uh, I enjoy solving puzzles, all varieties. I love jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, math puzzles. How about you, Dawn? So I don't think I'm on mute anymore. Um, I love dancing. Uh, that it just it energizes me. And I do dance like no one's watching because I don't want anybody to watch. But for example, Zumba, just all kinds of different dances energize me more than it tires me, which so it's a wonderful thing. Thank you, LaTanya, for leading that activity. I think Leah may contribute at this point. Yes, we have eating was the first one. And I laugh a little bit at that because I love that too. Camping, hiking, we have several that responded that way. Reading, making cards, lots more hiking and reading, yoga, spending time in the barn, sleeping. Oh, you got another dancing, Dawn. Working out, walking in the woods, rock hounding. Hmm. Horse shows, cross stitching, playing music, eating and laying on the beach, skincare routine. Ooh, listen to murder podcast, true crime. Going to the hairdresser to get my hair done, shopping, hunting, fishing, lots and lots of answers pouring in. Xbox, 
watching sports, color by number on my iPad, and someone said nothing. Uh-oh. And all of that is great. And I'm guessing I might have some uh, My Favorite Murder podcast fans here. That title is, by the way, very tongue in cheek. It is, uh, they actually focus a lot on mental health and self care as, as a way to deal with toxic stress. So I really appreciate you all putting everything in the chat like that. That was wonderful. Natanya, I don't know if you have anything to add, but you know, you can always just come off mute and chime right in. Yeah, th those were some interesting choices. Um, mm. I enjoy some of those things as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that you all are definitely a part of my tribe with all the things that you put in there. That was wonderful. And nothing, nothing is an, a legitimate answer. I'm not sure what I enjoy right now. And hopefully during this training we can kind of highlight some reasons why someone might be experiencing that and some strategies hopefully to counteract that so thank you again everybody for participating it's really important when we are doing this training um, Latanya and I want to encourage you to take care of yourself during the training because some of the information that we're going to go through may be pretty uncomfortable. Many participants have their own histories of trauma, and so this information may bring up some unpleasant memories. Please be sure to take a break if you need to. We respect your boundaries, and we know that all of you all will respect each other's boundaries as well. Breathing. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, perhaps do some deep breathing and know that we are here for you. Definitely feel free to reach out to Leah also if you need any assistance with anything. So why self-care? Let's explore this topic. Um, because it's, it's kind of a brief exploration because we're not here to persuade you or convince you, we're just inviting you to consider your options. And if at the end of this training, self-care is still not a good fit for you, that's okay. Remember, judgment-free zone. This is a safe place to be yourself. So when we're helping people who have experienced trauma, or if we live with somebody, if we are close friends, if we have people in our family members, you know, it's important to realize that it's really common for the people that we serve in whatever capacity to who have experienced trauma to exhibit challenging behaviors, some of which can be pretty severe and difficult for them. It's equally common for providers serving these people to become upset or even overwhelmed by what they see and hear. So we're going to talk more later about trauma and its effects. So other things that can impact providers or helpers, you know, empathy is an important tool that we use to help people who've been traumatized. However, if we find ourselves over empathizing or over identifying with someone, we could place ourselves at risk of internalizing their trauma and therefore becoming traumatized as well. And we'll definitely be talking about this. So empathy, which is a really important thing for helpers to have, can also kind of hinder us at times. Um, and then you see insufficient recovery time. Providers often hear the same or similar trauma stories over and over again with a lot of intensity at times and often have pretty high caseloads and expectations, and therefore they can become deprived of the recharge necessary to heal, or they're not able to get some distance from what they are hearing and witnessing. Um, and then unresolved personal trauma, as I've already kind of touched on, the pain of our own experiences can be reactivated when we hear someone describe a traumatic situation similar to one that we've experienced. What do you think about doing self-care? This is a judgment-free zone. There are no right or wrong answers. Please share your answers in the chat. 
Thank you, Latanya. You're welcome. So we have, I have loved to learn. I have learned to love, sorry, caring for me. It's a must do thing for what I do for a living. I love the idea, but it's hard. Someone said they're a self-care expert. Nice. Um, sometimes I feel selfish. I think it's important, but realistically, it's hard to get the time. I hardly make time for self-care, but I like the idea. Oh, someone has one. I have to take care of me in order to take care of others. It's tough to do sometimes. It's so important. You can't help anyone if you're not in a good place. I feel so much better afterwards. I feel self-care is super important, but got to manage time to do it. That's a repeating a recurring theme through this. It's really hard. I admire people who make time to do it. We're getting lots of, it's a must, and also lots of, it's an obstacle. It's a challenge. Yeah. Yes. I think that it's very common to see people on all kinds of aspects of the spectrum between, hey, I love it, I do it all the time, it helps me a lot, to I don't know anything about it, I'm not sure how to go about it, and so hopefully all of the things that you put in the chat will be addressed by this training, and if not, um, we definitely will invite you to reach out to us. Um, after the training to see if there's anything that we can answer for you or help you kind of work through. Obviously, we can't be anybody's therapist. That would be inappropriate, but we can be a part of your support system. So I really appreciate things that are being put in the chat. Leah, is there anything else you wanted to add before we move forward? There was one other that came in that I wanted to highlight. Um, another one about feeling guilty when I put me first. Yeah, yes. We actually address that in this training because that is so common. Um, and sometimes there are cultural reasons or societal reasons or just internal and external reasons that really impact that. So that's a that's a really important thing that I'm glad that we're going to be addressing. And Latanya, I don't know if there's anything you want to add or I can just move forward. Uh, well, I just like to say that as helpers, it's um, very it's usually a, a difficult thing for us to focus inward um, and we we all need to make a conscientious effort to do so. Yeah, that's right. But we also understand there are a lot of barriers that we have to that. So um, Hopefully, we will be able to help you figure out some of those. Thanks again for participating in that. I'm loving just the rich and meaningful information that you all are putting in the chat. So now we're moving on to the topic of trauma. What is it and how does it impact people? I'm guessing a lot of you know a lot about trauma and its effects and its causes. And for others, this might be newer information. So hopefully, this is either a good refresher or helpful information that you didn't know before. So when you look at this picture, consider these different levels of stress on this slide. Uh, and by the way, I just want to give a shout out to the Bounce Coalition, which is an organization in Louisville that trains school personnel and the community about adverse childhood experiences and trauma informed care, as well as building resiliency. I'm a trainer for their curriculum and borrowed some of their great slides uh, for this particular training. So when we're talking about positive stress, we're looking at you know, how this often actually improves performance. It's mild, short term, and we have a lot of support when we're going through that. And so an example of that would be studying for and taking an important exam or test. 
tolerable stress can be significant but still manageable. Even if it's moderate, it's temporary and you still have a significant amount of support. This can be an event like moving to a new home which my husband and I did a couple of years ago, and we're very happy that we did it, but it was tough when it was happening. Fortunately, it was temporary and we did have a lot of support. Then we're talking about toxic stress, which can have adverse outcomes. It's intense, long lasting with little or no support. And the list of examples of toxic stress are long, the different types um, or how traumatic events occur and, and affect us. And so during this training later, we're gonna be really examining toxic stress. And I do wanna stress the importance of the three variables that create the probability of stress becoming harmful. The intensity of the event, the length of time over which the event occurs, and the amount of support available to help someone get through the event. The more any of these three factors that are present, the higher the likelihood that the stress will be harmful. And so we've already kind of touched on this, you know, trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, assault, or a natural disaster, among many other things. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Longer term reactions can happen and they occur um, pretty regularly among human beings, right? So we may have um, reactions including unpredictable emotions or mood swings, flashbacks, strained relationships, or even physical symptoms such as headaches or nausea. And all of these things can be extremely impactful. And we also refer to these kind of reactions as trauma reactions. It's important to understand that anyone can have stress and trauma in their life. Traumatic events affect everyone differently. And there again should never be any judgment about how someone reacts to a traumatic event because we never know all of the factors that are going into this person's life as they're experiencing trauma. Clinical conditions or behaviors may have foundations in traumatic events that someone experienced or the accumulation of stress. Because of this, we can learn to be compassionate to all people because we never know what trauma or toxic stress they are dealing with. And again, just to remind you of the three variables that can create toxic stress and traumatic reactions, high intensity, long duration, and not enough support. You may have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, also known as ACEs, and I may revert to using that acronym. Uh, hopefully you'll remember what that is. If not, I apologize. And please put something in the chat anytime I use an acronym that's not familiar. But this study was created by Kaiser Permanente, which is a huge healthcare entity in the West, on the West Coast. And eventually the Center for Disease Control were so intrigued by the initial results that were happening um, with tens of thousands of people. And I think now we're looking at hundreds of thousands of people who have participated in this study that this, the CDC got actively involved. The study shows the very strong correlation and sometimes even causation between adverse childhood experiences and subsequent life challenges. The researchers discovered that there is a direct link between childhood trauma and the ad adult onset of chronic disease, as well as mental health or behavioral health. Um, challenges, social and economic challenges as well. And about two thirds of the participants experienced one or more type of adverse childhood experiences. So of the tens of thousands of people that participated, that's a pretty high number. So of those 87% had experienced two or more types of adverse childhood experiences. Because 
adverse childhood experiences usually don't happen in a vacuum or in isolation. For example, experiencing ongoing physical abuse and perhaps having a parent incarcerated as a result of that or who's for other reasons being incarcerated would count as a score of two on the adverse childhood experiences screener, which you can use a browser to look that up and get the actual screener if you haven't ever taken it. Um, it may be something to consider doing, especially if you have trusted people in your lives that you can talk about it with. Absolutely. So, um, just to clarify, each adverse, each type of adverse childhood experience counts as one. And so it's not how many times the one thing happened to you, let's say emotional abuse or neglect. It was each discrete adverse experience is counted as one. Hopefully that makes sense. The outcomes are dose dependent. More adverse childhood experiences can result in a higher risk of medical, mental, social, and economic problems as we age, become adults. And more, most importantly, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has labeled adverse childhood experiences as an epidemic in the United States. And I suspect other places in the world very much as well. But this is considered an epidemic, which is why I'm so committed to training people about adverse childhood experiences and how we can counteract those experiences, how we hopefully can stop them from happening in the first place and mitigate the effects of those when they have occurred for somebody. So this slide demonstrates how a higher ACE score can increase the risk of a variety of health and mental health behaviors. Compared with people with zero ACEs, those with four types of, of adversity or adverse experiences as children were twice as likely to be smokers, 12 times more likely to have attempted suicide, and seven times more likely to be alcoholic or to have uh, challenges with alcohol use. People with high A scores are more likely to be violent, to, to have more marriages and divorces, more broken bones, more drug prescriptions, more depression, more autoimmune diseases, and more work absences. And this is a grim note, and please note, we are going to be moving to the upside of all of this at some point during this training. Without intervention, people with six or more identified adverse childhood experiences have a lifespan that's 20 years shorter than those with zero ACEs. Hang in there. There is hope, okay? And of course, we know that there are other sources of trauma in childhood. So when we go back and look at the adverse childhood experiences, we see category of categories of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Hope, hopefully you all can see this slide okay. So physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect. This is very clearly a childhood adverse experience. And Household dysfunction can include a parent or caregiver with behavioral health challenges, an incarcerated relative, as I've already mentioned, um, interpersonal violence within the household, substance use disorders, and divorce. So sometimes people prickle a little bit about divorce being an adverse childhood experience. I want to address that and talk about the fact that the adverse part generally comes from the perceived loss by the child of a parent. So if you're used to seeing your parent daily um, and having a lot of interactions and all of a sudden you're visiting your parent who's left the home every other weekend or so, that could be considered an adverse childhood experience. But please remember, these things don't impact everybody in the same way. So some other common childhood adversities that are not currently a part of the screener developed by Kaiser Permanente, in particular, Dr. Vincent Felitti, 
it's really important that we acknowledge other sources of trauma in childhood. So this is a, a, an additional list that parts of the country are starting to incorporate into a screener, bullying, poverty, social isolation, racism or other types of discrimination, community violence, unsafe home or community environments with the lack of food or perhaps proper education, losing someone to death or other traumatic losses. And sometimes those losses are more ambiguous. Um, and maybe it's not death, but maybe it's a pandemic and you had to stop going to school and you're not seeing your best friends anymore and you're feeling pretty isolated. So ambiguous losses are really important as well. Perhaps like me, you had a parent who went to war. My father was in the Vietnam War and I consider that to be an adverse childhood experience. Thank goodness he survived and he's almost 85 and he's very hearty and healthy, but it was rough. Each of these has the potential to be considered an adverse childhood experience, even though it's not specifically a part of the ACEs study right now. I would definitely encourage anybody who assesses people for trauma to make sure that you include these specific other areas. And then again, I promise we will be getting to an upside, um, but compounding matters, the following things may be in the news, may be happening in our communities, maybe on our minds a lot, natural disasters, racialized and historical trauma of various kinds, the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, war, community violence, and the, this is just to name a few things we might be feeling exposed to. And if you're already experiencing some toxic stress effects, um, it's, it's important to note that these things could definitely increase the emotional and other effects of toxic stress. ACEs and trauma know no boundaries. None of us are immune. And we are all in this together as human beings. So regardless of any demographic, such as age, race, borders, culture, gender, and status, anybody can experience trauma. Anyone can have experienced adverse childhood experiences as well. The good news is that we can reverse the effects of trauma. This slide right here, which is a little packed with information, shows what we call the choice component because stress and trauma are so common for human beings. You can see the pendulum swing between when trauma occurs and when healing happens. So think about a person that you know that has shown this bounce back after trauma. So I'll tell you, for example, one of my nieces was involved in a car accident and was showing lots of trauma effects. Um, so her parents, uh, on my advice, I will say, that's my brother's family, took her to therapy specifically because of her trauma reactions after the car accident. It was clear the accident was causing her effects such as nightmares, talking a lot about the crash, sorry. And, um, sometimes even refusing to get into a car depending on her day and how things were going. So the therapist provided evidence-based trauma treatment. I was really pleased with how that went and taught her coping skills and helped her heal from the trauma and the effects. And so my niece, um, while still occasionally a little nervous at times, is still willing to get into cars, no longer has nightmares, doesn't reenact the accident during play, and she's not talking about it all the time anymore. So what we did as her village is to help her build her resilience, which is the ability to bounce back. Some people object to that phrase, bouncing back, 
I like to use the phrase working through it. It's you really can't avoid the effects of trauma. Um, and if you just kind of think, well, I'll just forget about it and go over it, get over it. Uh, sometimes we see that people are experiencing reactions and they they kind of are not even sure where they're coming from. And so being able to work through trauma, to move from, you know, the, the pre-traumatic life when a trauma occurs and there's pain, emotional and physical pain sometimes, life becomes difficult, to feeling that sense of hope. And I don't know if you all know this, but I would definitely encourage you to look it up if you don't. There's now something called the science of hope. And this isn't just some touchy-feely great thing. Now they're actually applying science to the concept of hope and how we can move from that abyss of despair into a, you know, sense of optimism, feeling successes, a stronger sense of self, and get into a post-traumatic life that often, if we're able to do the work and get the support that we need can be better than the pre-trauma life. Your empathy has improved. Um, you know, your ability to cope has improved. It's pretty amazing. So while we don't have choices in our experience of stress and trauma, resilience is a choice. And it begins with the acknowledgement that stress and trauma are unavoidable. Expectations of what should have been or could have been, so kind of bemoaning or grieving about that, which is a normal part of working through trauma, if we're stuck in that situation, we are not able to build our resilience and to have that growth in the aftermath of trauma. And by the way, post-traumatic growth is actually twice as likely to occur as post-traumatic stress disorder, because a lot of us have built-in resilience factors. And those can be all kinds of things, uh, people who really supported us as children, people that we have in our lives as adults who are supportive of us. There's all kinds of factors. And by the way, if you'd like to learn more about that, please go to Aetna's events page and look for in the next year, um, the bounce trainings that we do, which are the adverse childhood experiences and building resilience trainings. The difference between growth and long-term difficulties associated with trauma can be predicted by each person's resilience level. So building resilience is actually a prescription to help deal with the difficulties created by stress and trauma. A person can help other people, including children, to build resilience, but can also make a courageous choice to build their own resilience and experience post-traumatic growth. I will caution all of us to be careful about the timing of working with someone who's recently experienced trauma. Often they need to work through the shock and the pain and the grief around the traumatic events before building resilience. So we wouldn't ever want to use that language, hey, it's time for you to bounce back, right? Everybody is very different in their approach. Um, but if they've just had trauma occur, which we know in the state of Kentucky has really been very recent for parts of our state uh, for the last couple of years, we, we want to be careful in how we phrase things with those people. We want to be there for them. We want to listen actively, convey empathy, and help them kind of get to a point where they can start building their resilience. So the effects of trauma on providers or helpers. Um, we're going to discuss how various types of toxic stress occur, what they are, and how they can impact providers or helpers. These are some of the terms that we're going to be discussing in this section that I consider to be on the toxic stress spectrum, so to speak. With burnout, being on one side in some ways, it's not always linear, by the way, um, but oftentimes they're each kind of on the road to the more intense 
type of toxic stress. So compassion fatigue can build on toxic, uh, on burnout, and then secondary trauma can build on those two things as well, or they can each be discrete, separate things that are occurring to us as providers and helpers. All three are serious and can be accompanied by a varying degree of signs or symptoms from mild to serious. And again, sometimes we kind of do, do that road where we're burned out and then we're feeling compassion fatigue. And then we can even have secondary traumatic stress, often also called vicarious trauma. And the acronym for that is STS, secondary traumatic stress. Um, and it's very important for helpers to be aware of the signs and symptoms of each. So sometimes there's an accumulation of the signs and the symptoms. So the negative effects of burnout can spill over into every area of life. Burnout can also cause long-term changes to our body that make us vulnerable to illnesses and can cause long-term effects. Because of its many consequences, it's important to learn about burnout early on in our careers and our lives so that we can build the skills necessary to prevent burnout as well as recognize the symptoms when they occur so that we can deal with burnout as soon as it begins to happen. So burnout is one of the biggest health risks that helping professionals face because of work environment. And of course, I always want to encourage organizations and leaders to acknowledge all of these forms of toxic stress for employees, uh, especially those that are helpers in whatever capacity. And please note that burnout doesn't happen after one long, difficult day, right? You all know it's the accumulative effect of lots of days with lots of stress, especially if we're not actively and intentionally counteracting the signs and symptoms when they first arise. So as I've already mentioned, I consider burnout to be on one end of the stress continuum. Burnout should always be taken very seriously and ideally addressed as soon as the exhaustion, which is usually the first symptom or sign, starts to emerge. And you all know, I'm talking about the exhaustion, that kind that can't be cured with a good night's sleep or several good night's sleep or daily naps or vacation. I'm talking about that bone weary, fatigued sense that we get when we feel physically and emotionally just wrung out, right? And so we notice our motivation is low. Perhaps we dread getting out of bed in the morning and, and going to work or for foster parents or other kinds of parents, you know, facing your day of caring for other people. Even though it is often associated with the workplace, this can definitely occur for caregivers. And, you know, as a person with aging parents, caregiving is definitely a setup for potential burnout, as well as working a job where you're serving other people all day long, most likely selflessly, right, and not being able to recharge. So this is a very predictable outcome for a demanding work environment, which having worked in the behavioral health field for 30 something years, and yes, thank you, I appreciate the thought that, hey, I must have started when I was five years old. Now I've put in my time, I've experienced all of these elements or uh, things on the stress continuum myself, which is one reason why I'm so passionate about training other people on how to protect yourselves from this. But uh, having worked in behavioral health for many years in social or human services in a variety of capacities, um, I know what it's like out there. And after the pandemic, it's gotten even more intense with a lack of ability sometimes to find 
providers or people, employees to work in your organization, which then means other people are often having to work harder and have higher caseloads and demanding paperwork requirements that are necessary and important in terms of documenting um, the goals and the progress that people that we're serving have and are making. Um, and it's important to meet the criteria of lots of uh, bodies that oversight, that provide oversight or pay us for the work that we're doing. And at the same time, when you're burned out, all of that becomes completely overwhelming and not doable, or it feels like it's not doable. So let's get a little more specific. People who for, feel burned out often report physical, psychological, and cognitive symptoms, as well as relationship disturbances, as you can see on this slide, with fatigue or anger and irritability, frustration, negativity towards others, or in general, cynicism. Cynicism is where your perspective on people or the world makes you question other people's motives or even worth. Um, makes you question, is there good in people and human beings and in our world? Cynicism is a very heavy dose of hopelessness combined with doubt and that lack of optimism that things will work out okay, that human beings uh, are essentially good or want to be good, that the world has a lot to offer us. Um, and so further unhelpful and unhealthy coping strategies can be both signs and triggers for burnout, including the following. If you find yourself working longer and longer hours, and you know, that can be hard for those of us as the world is shifting towards lots of people working from home, that boundary between home life and work life can get very, very blurred. And um, sometimes we find ourselves responding to our devices around work emails and calls and texts, etc. at times when we had planned to focus on our home life. A lot of times when we're burned out, we find ourselves not delegating tasks. And, and this can include at home as well as at work. This delegating tasks is a really clear way to help mitigate burnout when it occurs or to help even prevent it before it occurs. And I know also that this is a skill set, right? Not everybody is good at delegating. Um, it can be definitely a struggle. But when you find that there are times when maybe you could have delegated, you are just running so hard and fast that you don't have time to stop and think about it. What can I assign or ask for help um, from other people? So to, what can I assign to other people? What kind of help can I ask for from other people? And asking for help, by the way, is something that we're definitely going to talk about. Um, not taking breaks. So do you find yourself working at your desk at lunch, working you know, through dinner, any of those things, um, not taking your leave time? as needed, uh, as available. Um, and sometimes organizations aren't as encouraging, especially in this time when we're really still recovering as a nation from the pandemic, which hasn't ended completely, right? That can be really, really hard to do. To take vacation means that then other people may have to monitor you know, the load of work that you have. Uh, so that's essential to for leaders to be thinking about because it's much easier to let somebody go on vacation than to have them quit and have to find somebody to hire, train them, et cetera, et cetera. Do you catch yourself rarely or never saying no and having a hard time setting limits for yourself and other people, which is very much a human dynamic that most of us probably encounter until we become very intentional about that? bottling up our feelings and pretending nothing is wrong, kind of pushing it away, pushing it down, oppressing that, 
sense of, you know, something's wrong, but I'm just going to put my head down, put my nose to the grindstone and keep going. Oftentimes, burnout can lead to procrastination and avoidance. Um, for me, that's one of my biggest clear signs. The exhaustion, that deep exhaustion, and finding myself putting off things, which actually ends up stressing me out more, then that's a sign for me, hey, you need to do something. Um, and of course, I already talked about working from home, but some of us who work in an office find ourselves taking work home. And we often find ourselves taking on other people's issues or problems in society to the point of very deep stress. So if you find yourself, quote, doom scrolling the news or your feed on your social media, then that could be exacerbating your burnout and the effects of burnout. And there's always such a fine line in balancing wanting to know and be informed and finding yourselves kind of focusing on, on the, the difficult things that are happening in our world. When you find yourself avoiding talking about important things, the way you're feeling, things that are causing you worry or anxiety, then those often tend to build up inside of us and can even become a pressure cooker situation where one day you just fly off the handle and it was over something insignificant. That's definitely a sign. If you find yourself squeezing out hobbies, or the things that you enjoy, which so many of you had amazing things that you like to do, even if you're not always able to do it, that you put in the chat when we first started this training. Misusing substances or food or technology um, as a way to try to cope. Sometimes those are helpful short term, not of course, I can't condone use, misusing substances, but sometimes food and technology can kind of feel good in the moment. But over time, if that's sort of the only way we're trying to rejuvenate, there can come a sense of emptiness with that. So if you're mixing that in with other things, you know, and that you allow yourself a yummy indulgence with food now and then, um, you know, that can be a wonderful part of your self-care. But if you just kind of are mindlessly eating, maybe standing over the sink at your desk, in your car, then it's very possible that you are using food as a way to cope, um, using technology as well. So now we're going to move to the next thing on the stress continuum, and that's compassion fatigue. And a lot of times, compassion fatigue is sort of burnout plus. Because it's the emotional residue of exposure from working with people who are suffering from the consequences of trauma, adverse childhood experiences, or traumatic events. Compassion fatigue has similar symptoms and signs to burnout, except for that compassion fatigue is how we're impacting when how we're impacted when we're actually absorbing the trauma and the emotional stress of others and aren't able to release that in some healthy way. Compassion fatigue is directly caused by the exposure to traumatic material and describes the impact of helping others, often accompanied by a lack of caring for ourselves, since the problems of other people often seem so intense in comparison to our own needs. So as we can see on this slide, there are many signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue that we are often not even aware of or of what they might mean, especially if we're experiencing several along the lines of physical and mental exhaustion, such as significant grief, sadness, or a sense of loss. And again, sometimes that loss, we can't really put our finger on it because it's what they call an ambiguous loss. It's not necessarily a 
death or a divorce or a breakup, but it's something else that we feel a sense of loss over. And as I mentioned earlier, it could be, you know, the losses that we've occurred that we have occurred to us sometimes during the pandemic. Um, where we're losing maybe the contact that we used to have with other people. We're losing some of our sense of autonomy and control. Um, when we find ourselves isolating from people who are important to us, that can definitely be a big and regular normal sign of compassion fatigue. Feeling that inability to be empathetic towards the people that you're serving and sometimes your own children or other people in your family or children that you may be fostering or um, helping in some other way. Uh, oftentimes we find ourselves blaming other people for their behaviors without taking into account trauma and how that may be creating these behaviors in other people. Um, we might find ourselves having significant sleep disturbances. Furthermore, we often experience a frequent use of sick days, being easily agitated, changes in our belief systems about people and the world, feeling that sense of detachment for, from others, where you're having a decreased emotional intimacy with other people. And it's also really common to see symptoms of physical and psychological problems, such as headaches or stomach issues. This also goes along with burnout, right? Muscle tension, that deep fatigue or exhaustion, psychological distress, such as moodiness or even anger outbursts, like road rage, um, kind of flying off the handle with people that you love. Finding that we've got a poor thinking, concentration, focus, or judgment around things that aren't normally the case. And then as always, relationship disturbances. So if you have answered yes to three or more of these signs or symptoms that I've just described, you may be on your way to compassion fatigue. And this is, of course, particularly likely for us when we neglect our own needs in an effort to be the perfect person, the perfect provider, the perfect parent, the perfect employee. And we know intellectually that perfection is impossible, right? If we were all perfect, life would be extremely boring and we wouldn't have anything to strive for. Um, and, and so really being able to recognize when you're feeling distressed because something went wrong, and especially when it was totally out of your control, um, when you're feeling like you're not helping somebody as much as you could, um, and that those kind of feelings can also lead us into our next discussion uh, about the continuum of stress, and that is the secondary traumatic stress or vicarious traumatization that I mentioned earlier. So in addition to compassion fatigue, there are other ways that providing care to trauma traumatized people can affect us. Trauma experienced as a result of prolonged or intense exposure to other people's trauma and their trauma reactions is how we get to this part of the continuum of having secondary traumatic stress. So surprisingly, this can be what happens when we start to feel almost as if the person's traumatic experiences happen to us. So you can see when we're working, especially daily or parenting or caregiving for someone who's traumatized, as helpers, we can start to feel a lot of different responses. Um, secondary traumatization can have even more intense signs and symptoms compared to compassion fatigue or burnout, such as shutting down, denying, just avoiding other people, feeling guilt 
about things that we witnessed or heard about when we're speaking with someone or working with someone who's experienced trauma. We can even have survivor's guilt, which can be an issue thinking, why did that happen to them? Why was I protected and they weren't? This is actually very common for helpers in human services of any kind. We can start to feel rage about the brutality or the unfairness of the world. We can feel even a sense of shame, depending on the meaning that you place on the traumatic experience that you witness or hear about. Because shame is often associated with feelings of weakness, vulnerability, and helplessness. There, you may be having thoughts that somehow you should have or need to now protect someone from the traumatic experiences that can create this sense of shame. And it can be very pervasive throughout our lives. People who have experienced traumatic events, especially as children, often carry sort of a toxic cloud of shame around with them through absolutely no fault of their own. But because children who experience trauma, um, their locus of control is almost always internal, right? If my caregivers, my village, my society is supposed to take care of me and they're not, then that must mean there's something wrong with me, which is, is what creates that sense of shame that can actually be taken on by helpers and providers. We can also feel horror that such bad things can happen, especially to innocent people or children. Not that it should happen to, you know, not innocent people, but it can be very horrifying to hear stories about bad things happening to people. And that can be accompanied by that sense of helplessness to be able to do anything or change anything, which can go along with a world view, right? We're very familiar with that world view of, well, there's nothing I can do to help people along with all these other things. And just a little uh, comment on vulnerability. This may be a little uncomfortable for you to hear, so I apologize, but hopefully you have watched Brene Brown TED Talks or listened to podcasts or read her books around vulnerability, because vulnerability is a human condition. None of us can escape being vulnerable. And in fact, the more we try to pretend like we're not vulnerable, the more vulnerable we are to things happening without our ability to cope or prevent those things. And I know that some people may consider that to be kind of a radical concept, but when you accept your vulnerability, you are actually able to set up realistic ways of coping and to be able to build your resiliency by accepting vulnerability. That doesn't mean that we're always happy about it and we just say, well, I'm vulnerable, I'm not gonna do anything about it, right? Obviously, vulnerability is something that we want to be able to face head on as much as possible and almost always with the support of very important people in our lives, that recognition that we're all vulnerable. And I have to say, I really appreciate um, the, the little uh, reactions that occasionally come up on my screen. That makes me feel more connected to you all. And I really appreciate you responding by, you know, a thumbs up, a clap, a heart, any of those things. Um, let's me know that I think I feel like you're hearing me and you're, you're getting what Latanya and I are talking about. So as a provider or a helper, you may be exposed to someone's trauma through what the person tells you, what they talk about in your presence. Um, when working with or parenting children who've experienced trauma, we often witness a child's traumatic play or drawings or other representations of the trauma. And oftentimes that's a lot of talking about it or not talking about it at all and just experiencing trauma reactions over and over and over again, which can be very painful and difficult for us to witness. 
And of course, this can also occur when you're working with adults. Um, you may, you know, hear them talking about it. You may witness their reactions to trauma. And if you're a therapist in particular and you're doing, you know, all kinds of trauma treatment interventions, things can often come out even more strongly in those situations that are pretty painful. Observing a person's reaction to trauma reminders um, which can be a long list of different kinds of trauma reminders can be lots of emotional reactions cognitive or even behavioral responses to trauma and that can be very overwhelming for us when we're working with folks who are experiencing this if you live with someone if you're caring for someone a child or an adult who has had a lot of traumatic um, situations and or responses in their lives then we're exposed and it's important to acknowledge that not just as a helper or provider but as an organization and as a leader to recognize that all of these things on the stress continuum are job hazards for people who are helpers for people who are providers or caregivers these are all job hazards and we've already talked that there are a lot of overlaps between compassion fatigue and secondary trauma with secondary trauma we often see not just low energy or fatigue but again that lack of motivation and that strong dismissiveness around the need to care for ourselves why would i care for myself when these people have so much going on in their lives and i'm one of the only people to help them right it's hard to to make a good rationale for helping yourself and taking care of yourself which hopefully we can give you a lot of food for thought around that during this training we find ourselves again i cannot emphasize that social withdrawal, disconnecting from important people and isolating ourselves. And I'm not talking about what people who may consider themselves to be introverts do, right? A lot of times introverts or people who are kind of on a spectrum between extroverts and introverts um, find that they need a lot of alone time to recharge and reset and reinvigorate. That's okay. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you're unhappy, um, especially with your social withdrawal, but you don't have the energy, the motivation, the means sometimes to reach out and connect with people. That's a whole different story from deliberately and intentionally recharging. And by the way, if you're not sure if you're an introvert or extrovert, I would strongly invite you to consider figuring that out. I am not recommending anything in particular, but for example, sometimes people just go online and take um, a Myers-Briggs personality test and that can really help us figure out our vulnerabilities to the things on the stress continuum and how we might do best in managing any signs or symptoms or preventing those signs and symptoms from happening so if you didn't know you were an introvert and you're feeling some of these signs and symptoms it might be because you didn't know hey a lot of introverts need a b or c or extroverts need a b or c in order to interact with the world with themselves with the people that they're caring for we may also and these are kind of interesting effects from secondary traumatization or secondary traumatic stress an increased sensitivity to violence threat or fear or on the flip side a decreased sensitivity to violence threat or fear so you're either kind of feeling what we call hyper vigilance with an increased sensitivity you find yourself looking over your shoulder even when it's not necessary you don't feel safe in spaces um, that can definitely be a sign of trauma for the people that we're working with and it can definitely be a sign of secondary traumatic stress the decreased sensitivity to violence threat or fear can come about when we're numbed out 
And I think everybody who does all of this work has experienced times when you just can't hear one more story. You know that your Tuesday four o'clock appointment um, is going to be challenging and it's going to really require you to be on your toes and you're just feeling that exhaustion. So I think a lot of us know that kind of numbed out, disconnected feeling. When you're feeling just a generalized despair and sense of hopeless, hopelessness, it's very pervasive in all areas of your life. When you've lost your sense of humor, that is a significant sign. Uh, we've already talked a lot about changes in worldview. I'd like to add to that changes in spirituality in whatever way you may have. And, and the sky's the limit for that as far as I'm concerned. But if you're really finding your sense of spirituality to be negatively impacted by your work, that's a significant sign as well. And then, of course, across all three of burnout, compassion fatigue, and STS, we notice that sleeping problems, bad dreams, and all kinds of physical symptoms, headaches, stomach aches, physical exhaustion can happen. And so you can see there's a lot of overlap, but sort of the intensity and the volume gets stronger and stronger. And it is, um, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say this, impossible to do this work as if you are experiencing secondary traumatic stress, vicarious trauma, you are not able to effectively help other people. And this is no judgment on you. Um, this may be the first time you're hearing of any of this. You may not feel as supported in your uh, work or home environment as you could be, and that it's difficult to do the things that you need to do to overcome the effects. But I want to let you know, all three of these are very serious, as I've already mentioned, but secondary traumatic stress stops you in your tracks in terms of being able to help other people. And again, this is not blaming anyone. This can happen to each and every one of us at any given time. You're not weak. There's not anything wrong with you. You're just human. And so there, I'm hoping, is no sense of guilt or shame around secondary traumatic stress. Even if you're in the throes of it right now, you deserve the help that you need to feel better. And you should never be blamed for any of this. Um, so I just want to really emphasize that if you're in this situation, I, I would invite you very strongly to consider talking to somebody. It could be a trusted friend. It can be a trusted peer. You can notice that I'm using the word trust. That's important. It can be a trusted supervisor or it might be your EAP provider, it might be your own therapist that you decide to get, whatever you choose to do, you, you deserve the support and the opportunity to recover, just as the people that you are serving deserve the support and recovery opportunities to deal with their own trauma and to come out on the post-traumatic uh, or the post-trauma side of that pendulum that we saw in that slide earlier. So secondary traumatic stress, I just want to say, is the natural consequent behaviors and emotions resulting from knowing about a traumatizing event experienced by a significant other and the stress resulting from helping or wanting to help a traumatized or suffering person. And um, I'm hearing some feedback, Leah, I don't know, somebody might be off mute or you might be trying to communicate with me. Um, so Charles Figley said this, and he is our one of our biggest experts for decades about vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress, secondary traumatization. You hear me kind of using those terms interchangeably. 
but it is the natural consequence resulting from working with someone with trauma. It's normal to have this. Let's discuss barriers to good self-care. Unfortunately, providers often face many barriers um, to taking care of themselves. To start, the phrase, take care of yourself, has become so often said that for many, it has lost all meaning. Uh, when casually, um, someone casually tells us to take care of ourselves, uh, we may feel invalidated, frustrated, or even angry. It's easy to say, it's not easy to do. Many of our beliefs are very unconscious and deeply ingrained beliefs. It is selfish to care for myself. We imagine a perfect person being one who is completely selfless, flowing with boundless love and compassion for others. Because of this belief, self-care leads to feelings of guilt. Strong people sacrifice their needs to meet the needs of others. We imagine that if we are courageous enough, we can ignore our own needs and sacrificially meet the needs of others. I don't deserve self-care because I have not earned it. We believe life gives us what we deserve and we must earn anything good that comes into our life. We struggle to see ourselves as good enough to earn the right to enjoy self-care. We could have done more or been better. I don't have time to focus on myself. We believe that self-care is time consuming rather than something that happens on a moment to moment basis. We tend to ignore the reality that uh, we are quite good at wasting time on ourselves when we are watching TV or engaged in other mindless, non-refreshing activities. I am controlled by my circumstances. We tend to have an external locus of control rather than an internal locus of control mindset. We do not see ourselves as in charge of our responses and capable of making choices regardless of the situations we are in. The challenges we face seem to, to, seem to be something that makes us miserable and our stress response and poor coping inevitable. Are you a natural caregiver? Uh, many who choose to work in human services are natural caregivers with pets, partners, children, and aging parents who all require care and attention. Most days, the amount of energy we devote to others needs far exceed any energy directed to our own well being. In fact, Many helpers or caregivers are uncomfortable being on the receiving end of others' attention and assistance. Um, they don't seem to needy, they don't want to seem needy or like they are uh, not up to the challenge they are taking on. Do you work hard to be there for others? remember birthdays with homemade cake, volunteer at ch ch child school, deliver meals to sick friends, help out at church, serve on task force or focus groups that address kids' needs. Many providers really wanna be there for others. We tend to naturally uh, be helpful people. We want to remember, well, I'm sorry, I already said that. <laughs> Um, it's also hard to know what would help you. Too often, providers simply do not know what would help them. They know something is wrong or missing, but can't put their finger on just what might be, make them feel better. Who do you turn to 
when things get tough. Please do not mention names, just give role in your life. For example, a coworker, best friend, mentor, family member, um, please specify the family member, um, supervisor, someone you can give to and accept feedback from comfortably, someone you trust, of course, we always want to protect confidentiality when talking to others. Um, please put your answer in the chat. We have answers lying in again. We have grandfather, husband, mother, sister, um, a friend at work, supervisor, partner, a friend, a worker, mentor. Lots of best friends and spouses. My minister, therapist, sponsor, Jesus, adult daughters, someone said they don't have anyone that, that they feel comfortable with, parent, Yeah, my adult daughter is one of, um, the, she's my top choice as well. <laughs> Any more? Um, repeats of the ones that I named. Thank you. So the road to good self-care. Um, from working with and training a large variety of providers and parents, I know that oh, uh, to overcome social, mental, and emotional barriers to self-care, um, you must first come to understand the importance of taking care of yourself and then build self-care into your daily routine. You must believe that you are worth taking care of and that your happiness and well-being are not peripheral to, but essential when helping others. I'm careful to never shame or blame anyone for not engaging in self-care. Getting there is a process with lots of ups and downs and bumps in the road. I attest to that. <laughs> Even people who train on self-care regularly have lapses. They are just more aware of when they are getting too stressed and can make and implement a plan immediately. The following slides are ideas we invite you to consider, but no, they aren't all ways applicable to everyone. Give yourself permission to need something. It's okay to ask for help. Having needs and trying to meet them is not a sign of incompetence or weakness. It is part of healthy life. Thirst is your body's signal to drink and prevent dehydration. In the same way, when you feel stressed out, it is a time to take a break so you can regain perspective and deal with issues at hand more constructively. Keep it simple. Make life choices that fit your life. Develop consistent routines. Create a safe environment. Understand and respect your limits. Resist the impulse to overcommit what little time you have. Prioritize by saving energy for things that really matter and seek outside help as soon as you need it. When possible, take advantage of leave time to relax and restore. Have downtime every day. Maybe it's a morning walk. It might be 10 minutes with the paper and a good cup of coffee. It can be writing in your journal before bed. It could be the drive into work or times of silent prayer in church. Your mind, body, and soul need time to regenerate from life's stresses. 
If you have no downtime, a time without distractions and demands, you cannot benefit from moments of reflection and calm that may help you to center and stay balanced. Consider getting support. Meeting with other providers who have similar experiences and feelings is one of the most powerful and renewing activities for anyone experiencing toxic shock. It's toxic stress, sorry. <laughs> Just knowing that you are with people who get it is affirming. If a group is not an option, find at least one person outside your immediate family with whom you can be real and whom you can trust to understand. If you don't feel you have time, consider joining an online or Facebook support group. Routinely have something scheduled you can look forward to. It doesn't have to be elaborate, expensive, or fancy. Maybe it's coffee with a neighbor or best friend one weekend morning, or a yummy dinner on a Friday night, or date night with your partner. It could be going alone to the grocery store Saturday morning or having an uninterrupted bath. Remember, waiting too long to reward yourself for a job well done is not an effective way to shape your behavior. Immediate, immediate positive reinforcement works for adults too. And extenuate the positive. It may not be easy, but as you step back to evaluate how you are doing, find time to laugh at silly situations that come up. Recognize the good in yourself and your life. Take note of the things you are grateful for. Some people identify one thing a day they are grateful for. I try to do that myself. Celebrate every step forward, no matter how small. Stay connected with your partner or someone important to you. Eat something you really enjoy. Nutrition is important. Indulgence can be wonderful. Keep a balance. <laughs> Find affirmation in the process of your work. Thank you, LaTanya, that was wonderful. Um, you know, human beings are relational. I mean, it's in our DNA, even if it can be disrupted by traumatic things that happen to us. And so when it comes down to the basics, relationship tends to be the most determining factor of healthy, whole living. And that is so easy to lose sight of, right? Positive relationships are the single strongest predictor of resilience. Researchers looked at people who self-reported being in the top 10% of the happiest people. And the key factor that distinguished them from the other 90% included good emotional intimate relationships with families, friends, colleagues, social circles. Another significant factor is that these positive relationships are face-to-face -face personal interactions. So it's not about how many friends or followers that we have on social media, because research actually shows the opposite. The more your relationships are on social media platforms, the less happy you are. Now, please know there's a couple things that I wanted to say. For example, earlier when LaTanya was talking, she was saying, you know, watching TV could be a mindless activity. Please know that we're not judging. Um, that's just kind of what some of the research shows that if it's a show that you really enjoy, you're getting a lot out of it, it's making you laugh, it's making you cry, it's engaging you, that may be a beautiful part of your self care. And along the same lines, if you have good in-person in kinds of interactions with people, social media is, is sometimes really an addition to that. It can give a lot of meaningful richness to our lives. So we're not saying don't be on social media. We're just saying 
the research shows that if your relationships are only through devices and through social media, you're not going to be able to be as happy as relationships that are more face to face. And we know that this is a current concern with a lot of our youth as well as adults and sometimes even kids, right? Not having those face-to-face -face relationships can skew a lot of things about how we see the world and can impact our happiness. Um, and it's great news that having positive relationships is the strongest predictor of resilience because that's something that we can build and we can definitely help other people build. Compassion fatigue, as I've already mentioned, secondary trauma, burnout, they're all bona fide job hazards for helpers. We're not weak or ineffective if we experience the effects. I have to reiterate this, and Latanya does too, over and over and over again, because sometimes our society sets us up for feeling like we're weak if we're just, we don't have it all together all the time, right? Which is impossible for humans to be. So accepting and acknowledging that, and if you notice the effects of burnout or compassion fatigue or, you know, secondary traumatic stress, it's okay to reach out and ask for help. Or if you notice it in other people, you can kindly and warmly kind of talk to them about it in a no shame, no blame way, just to say, hey, I noticed that you're not going out to lunch with us like you used to, and you're kind of in your office with your door closed a lot, and um, you're not sort of the life of the party that you normally are when we're working together. I just wanted to check in with you and see how things are going and sort of ask open ended questions and do reflections instead of telling them how they need to fix it. Just be there to listen. Sometimes that makes us feel so better, so much better to have someone to listen to us, to be the person that can listen to someone and really help them. So the solution is definitely self-care. I think you've picked up on that by now, right? I nurture myself so I can nurture other people. Since all helpers are inevitably changed by this work, our best safeguard is self-awareness and a commitment to self-protection. And again, recognizing that if you're not doing any self-care kind of stuff right now, that's that's okay. There's no blame or shame. And it's probably not going to be that difficult to figure out how to do that by really coming up with baby, baby, baby steps. And if you're already doing self-care um, and you're pretty good at it, this is maybe a great reminder. This might help you have talking points when talking to other people about self-care. Um, I just hope that you all can see that we don't want to blame or shame anybody for the level or lack of level of self-care. Self-compassion is huge when it comes to being able to do self-care. Empathy, as we know, the research shows that if someone talks to or goes to a provider or a helper who's very empathetic, um, that is healing in and of itself, even beyond the interventions that they may be applying to the person that they're helping. Um, just by listening in an empathetic way, we are helping people. And it's the same thing applies to us. Empathy for ourselves helps heal us. We often feel really awkward about pra practicing self-compassion, kind of along the lines of some of the barriers that LaTanya talked about, because sometimes our society gives us messages that make us confuse self-compassion with something like self-pity, or it may feel like we're being self-indulgent, or maybe we're making excuses for our own bad behavior, right? Which by the way, all of those things are definitely the opposite of self-compassion. Studies show that people who have compassion for themselves are happier, more optimistic, and more grateful than those who are harder on themselves, that maybe have unrealistic expectations of ourselves. And in fact, practicing self-compassion helps us take responsibility and be accountable for our lives and our behaviors so that we can actually change. Self-compassion helps us bounce back more quickly from difficult situations like divorce, for example. Um, losing a job, losing somebody, we can build self-compassion in all kinds of ways. 
through the use of mindfulness techniques. And I would definitely invite you to use your favorite browser to look up mindfulness. You will see 300 billion articles, videos, all kinds of things that you can find something that suits your mindfulness um, kind of the way you're geared towards doing mindfulness. And for some people, that's yoga. For other people, it's body awareness exercises such as deep breathing and progressive relaxation. And again, there's no one tool that fits everyone. So for someone who's prone to panic attacks, um, being in the middle of a panic attack or anxiety attack and having someone tell you, okay, just breathe deeply may or may not work right? But it may work to do a grounding exercise when you're in that mode that you're looking at, you know, five things that you can see, uh, four things that you can hear. There's a whole mantra around that, that, you know, you that you feel your feet on the floor or on the earth, that you feel your body in your chair or in your bed, wherever it is. Um, for me, if I find at night when I go to bed that my brain is just kind of worrying and and maybe I'm sort of um, perseverating or fixated on something that deep breathing and for works for me and when it doesn't I do progressive relaxation activity where I picture a warm blue light swirling up from my feet to the top of my head in a very measured way. So I talk to myself, usually before it even gets to my hips, I'm asleep when I do that. But that's not going to work for everybody. Um, it's a trial and error, which makes it sometimes a little harder, but it pays off. Everyone has their own things, hobbies, interests, and passions. Um, even if you're not aware of them right now, somewhere inside of your psyche, you have something. Um, sometimes it's just important to uncover that. So you want to figure out the best way for you to counteract the effects of compassion, fatigue, burnout, secondary traumatic stress. You can see some ideas that people have come up with. All of these things are ways to counteract toxic stress um, if they work for you. Right. So I, Latani and I are not saying, OK, go out and do every single thing that's on this chart. Right. There may be nothing on this chart that you like, but somewhere inside of you, there's something we want to emphasize that for some of you, none of these are appealing and that's OK. We don't want to hand you a plan or a prescription. We just want to increase your awareness and plant a seed for thought about what does work for you. So you may want to do some journaling. You may want to talk to somebody who knows you really well. You may say, I can't think of anything that I like right now because you may be in the throes of compassion, fatigue, burnout, or secondary trauma, and you may need to escalate um, how you're figuring this out by talking to a therapist or somebody that you really trust. So sometimes um, when I need a good laugh, because laughter is key, healthy humor can flood us with good feelings and lightness. I will watch some reels or TikTok videos, usually about kittens or babies who are laughing uncontrollably. Have you seen some of those videos? Um, you know, just humorous things and trying to stay away from the doom scrolling and um, sometimes I'll put on a, a podcast. Pandora actually has comedian stations that you can uh, subscribe to if you're a Pandora person. Um, I have particular favorites, you know, like Jim Gaffigan or Maria Bamford, just to name a couple of them, um, because laughter is so just life-giving, life-affirming. It lightens you. You know, you've seen the research over and over that if you smile long enough, you actually improve your mood. Well, I say the same thing for laughter. We invite you to maintain realistic optimism, hopefulness, and a sense of humor in the face of difficult situations. Consider attending to your spiritual life because compassion fatigue often damages a person's sense of meaning, connection, and hope.
by spirituality, we encourage you to consider that in whatever way is meaningful to you. Don, you're muted. Thank you, LaTanya. Thank you, Leah. So as a way to counteract stress, let's talk about daily self-care activities that you can reasonably do, reasonably, that you look forward to, that you're being intentional about. You know, you probably do a zillion things every day to please and help other people and to take care of their needs. But what can you do every day just for you? And you may not know that right now so you may go on a journey of discovering you know for me um there are different things that i do that i don't spend a ton of time on most of them right so a lot of times in the evenings i'll take a break and i'll get in the recliner with my little old lady cat who loves nothing better than to snuggle with me um, on the weekends sometimes she and i and my other cat if they're not fighting over me we'll take a nap together and it's just that warm you know, soft purring little body next to me that rejuvenates me and makes me happy. That's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, so when you're coming up with something, it's important to know what will give you pleasure, what will reduce your stress, what will just meaningfully keep you physically fit and strong without a lot of pressure to do stuff that you don't want to do? What will restore your mental balance? What will make you laugh every day? What can you do that's just plain fun? So you can see all the suggestions on this slide. Of course, there's no one, no one size fits all on here. So you may be like, oh, I don't like any of these, but you know what? I do like this, right? Or that. So these are just some ideas. I invite you right now to think about what you can or already realistically work into your daily schedule and write it down. And that's not always easy. I understand that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But research shows without a doubt that if you want to make a change, um, it doesn't have to be fancy, but you want to write it down so that you set it as your intention and that it reminds you. So, you, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can use that to remind you. And I'm also really emphasizing that this is 100% you and about you. So if somebody says, oh, you need to start working out and here's how you should do it. Um, that may not give you pleasure. It may be something you dread. It could actually add to your accumulation of stress by doing that. But if somebody says, hey, you know, maybe moving would be helpful. Well, what kind of movement works for you? Um, and, and again, no guilt trips, right? That's we're not uh, packing our bags and going on a guilt trip with any of this stuff. So now that you might have jotted down one simple baby step thing or the things that you're already doing daily to help take care of yourself, it's important to be mindful about weekly or monthly things. What are some activities that you might not be able to do every day, but you can commit to doing on a weekly and I would say and monthly basis. So one thing weekly and at least one thing monthly. So let's brainstorm some ideas of things that you can do weekly or monthly to care for yourself and relieve stress. And just a reminder that connecting meaningfully with another person is an important part of self-care and self-compassion. So you can see the ideas that other people have come up with for weekly or monthly self-care activities. And again, the sky's the limit, right? Play cards, go bowling, have a nice dinner out or in with your partner or your friend, get a manicure, pedicure, a massage, 
or if you can't afford any of that, you know, just hang out with a group of friends in the park or at somebody's house, you know, do a potluck, attend a support group meeting, go to the movies if that's something that you like to do, you know, go to festivals, go to events if you have the money to do that stuff, maybe attend spiritual services of any kind. You know, now that we have some ideas, I invite you to write your choices into your self care plan. Be sure that these are things that you really enjoy and can realistically do at least one a week and once a month you know my husband and i preserve friday nights for our date night weekly and then monthly we try to get together with other people weekly we also get together with our extended family members um, so we have dinner with his mom every tuesday and we hang out with my mom most saturdays or sometimes everybody gets together on sunday depending but we're really conscious of how important that is and i will say actually quarterly my husband and i try to do a getaway even if it's just taking a drive somewhere um, that's really important when you join this training today even if you didn't know it, you already have resources for self-care, but hopefully as a result of this discussion, you'll have discovered a few more options and will become even more motivated to take care of yourself. And remember, the best plan in the world will only work if you actually follow through with it. So I encourage you to post your self-plan somewhere where you can see it. Maybe you want it private. Maybe you want it, you know, people in your household to see so that they can support you doing it and you're modeling for them as well. Um, you know, this is a reminder of your commitment to taking good care of yourself, which means that you may be able to take better care of the people that you serve, the people in your life. And this is a wonderful way to model for your children the importance of self-care. Of course, this is just like a drop in the bucket in terms of suggestions of what might work for you weekly or monthly. So now that we've looked at the impact of the toxic stress continuum um, and we've asked you to put some ideas down, um, remember that the goal of the self-care plan is to help you maintain a balance between work and relaxation between your commitments to yourself and other people and know that that this doesn't mean a balance of 50 50 right it's the balance that works for you i mean we can't do 50 percent of our time usually just for ourselves, and the other 50 percent for work and other people right we recognize that the balance is the kind of balance you identify and of course, always emphasizing it should include activities that you do purely for fun. And it should, it can, I don't want to should on you by saying that, but I'm just saying I invite you to consider including a regular stress management approach, such as a physical activity, enjoy meditation, yoga, or prayer. So one thing that my husband and I do at least three times a week is just take a walk around our neighborhood. You know, we're still learning about our neighborhood and we love, there's a lot of people with dogs. And so we love, you know, saying hi to people and their dogs and, and it gives us some time to decompress with each other and sometimes you know we're communicating about things that we need to talk about sometimes we're planning sometimes we're just talking about our day sometimes we're just joking around and laughing so please write some things down you know making a plan is key because a goal without a plan is just a wish pick one thing you can do daily and you know, then once you come up with a plan, what's the biggest threat to doing those things that are important things to consider? How can you manage any of those threats? And by threats, I mean things that are derailing your self-care plan. And who can help keep you accountable without fussing and lecturing you, but just to say, hey, remember you said when we were on vacation, you weren't going to check your work email. Uh, how? What can I do to help you distract you from your work email? Um, Okay. And please, above all, please just remember that you've got to play. The kind of play that you enjoy, we 
really invite you to be mindful about getting enough playtime on a regular basis. And that's hard when we become adults. That's like at the end of our list of priorities, right? Well, we're just kind of putting it on your radar. Maybe make it the middle or even the top of your priorities. And don't you love that music? I don't know where I got that. It's very 70s. If you can find a balance between caring for others and meeting your own needs, you will ultimately be much better equipped to do both. Caring for people who have experienced trauma is a matter of the heart. Self-care is a mindset and a positive choice. There is no shame in experiencing burnout, compassion fatigue, or secondary trauma. Without compassion and empathy for others, we wouldn't be impacted by this work. So being impacted means you care. Take a moment and think about why you decided to do this work. What strategies or activities do you use to keep your commitment from fading? Remembering these facts when you begin to feel stressed or overwhelmed might help during the harder times. Thank you, Latanya. So we might come back to this, but um, Tanya, do you mind just talking about this slide? Not a problem. Thanks. Caring for ourselves allows us to give others the best of us rather than just what's left of us. Which I think is a pretty profound statement. I really love this uh, meme. And, the, you know, I would love to for you to take away with you these wise words from Brene Brown, of whom I'm a huge fan, and actually got to see her live, which like made my year when I got to do that. Talk to yourself like you would to someone you love. So we really appreciate your time and attention. And I would just invite you to look at our Aetna, Aetna Better Health of Kentucky's event page for more trauma trainings of various kinds. Uh, we have upcoming trainings related to trauma, ACEs, building resiliency, self-care for foster parents, self-care for providers, which you attended today. And I will be putting that in the chat in just a moment, but I know for now, we may have some questions that uh, we want to talk about right Leah you do the first one is have there been any research between ACEs and the related increase in autoimmune diseases oh that's an excellent question yes absolutely um, in fact I mentioned that I think earlier on when we were talking about that but I will tell you anecdotally I have seen some of the people that are most important to me and closest to me who I'm aware of their trauma histories having very clear cases of autoimmune types of disorders and sometimes strange ones, if that makes any sense. And sometimes it's hard for the medical field to figure that out. And I've just noticed that trend more and more as I became more and more uh, clear about how ACEs can impact our health. So that is an excellent question. And the next question is, is there an age at which resilience is no longer able to be built? No way, no way. Um, the only thing that I would say is if, for example, somebody is unfortunately experiencing, um, you know, some form of dementia, that might make it harder. Um, and that is even more important for the caregiver of these people that are having a hard time with their cognition to take care of themselves. But yeah, it can happen at any age, little kids, youth, adults, elderly people, let's do it. And then one more, any guidance about taking home the compassion fatigue from work to a partner with a high ACE and low PCE, which is positive childhood experiences score of their own. Can you repeat that question? Please? Yes. Any guidance about taking home the compassion fatigue from work to a partner with a high ACE and low PCE score of their own? Yeah. Well, of course, we want to protect that person, right? And usually um, our partners are not the 
great people to talk about work with, um, maybe if they're in the field, but when you're talking about a partner with those kinds of things going on, it's really important to protect them from the work that you're doing. And it's really important for you to find that person that you can talk to safely while protecting confidentiality about this stuff. So I definitely have had partners in the past that were like, la, 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 la. They didn't want to hear anything that I had to say about that. I became very careful not to share my work with that person. And that was actually really helpful because I was able to build that support network that I have to this day of coworkers and close friends that I can talk. But I know my friends that I don't talk about this stuff with. I know those folks. So thank you for that very thoughtful question. And someone asked where or how can you be reached? So do you want to drop your email in the chat box? Yes, I will definitely do that. While I'm doing that, because we have a couple of minutes left, if there are no other questions, I would love it if you all would just put one thing in the chat that you're considering doing for self-care, either daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever works for you. Just one thing from your self-care plan that you jotted down. And remember, baby steps are awesome. No problem with those at all. Oh yeah, yeah I'm seeing great stuff. Generally taking a walk, holding myself to my boundaries, walking my dog, exercise. And then someone had a comment not related to that question. I hope that information on ACES gets out there to a larger population. Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely, that is one of my missions in life is getting that information as well as, you know, about burnout, compassion, fatigue, and secondary trauma. So I really appreciate your thoughtful comments, everybody. I just pa pasted into the chat, the link to um, our uh, page that has our events and trainings, you have to kind of search a little bit, but if you just keep going down, you'll, you'll see, and they say in your area, meaning Kentucky, because Edna is a national. I'm also putting in the chat my email address, and Latanya, I'll invite you to do that if you're okay with it, and if not, that's okay too. And Dawn, I'm not seeing the link. It might be because we have so many comments scrolling here. No, I hadn't done it yet. <laughs> okay, good. It. It's, it's, there it is. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You all, it's just been wonderful. I love all these um, ideas. I love the questions. I love, you know, yes, all these things. Riding a new bike. I have asked for that for my birthday is a new bike. Um, having a me night with no distractions, setting boundaries with work activities. Gosh, that's fabulous. Um, monthly explorations of Kentucky, caves, parks, and lakes, daily exercise. You know, I see a lot of that yoga, mindfully, systematically decluttering to reduce stress. Okay, Jessica, I will hire you because I always need that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, being aware of when I need to step back from helping others. Absolutely. Um, going shopping. Ooh, retail therapy can be really awesome as long as you're not breaking the bank, right? Um, oh, yeah, journaling. There's just so many things. Don't talk about work at home. When you're off work, be off work. Yeah, I love that. Cross-stitching. I'm sorry if I miss any, but these are just fantastic. Um yeah, exploring and learning and experiencing new things, taking a small trip to a new forest. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, these don't have to cost anything, right? Everybody has a different budget and a different ability. And some, some of us have large families that we're supporting. And maybe there's just something that, you know, it's all about me time, as somebody already mentioned, doing some baking. Yes, learning to say no put myself first without the guilt. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate all of you so much. And I know there's probably more things in the chat. Um, reading a great book, I'm right there with you. Um, there's a lot of things about maintaining boundaries that just excites me. All of these are just really exciting. Getting outside more with my, my kid and my dog, meditating walking, going to bed on time. Absolutely. Going to the chiropractor. I'm right there with you. I go weekly. Um, 
because tension just binds up my neck and my shoulders and my lower back and um yeah so these are wonderful thank you all so much have a wonderful rest of the week and i hope that this weekend maybe you can indulge in your weekly uh, stress reducing activity or your monthly one and hopefully starting today you'll do at least one little thing to help you manage your stress and take care of you and i would like to also thank latanya so much for um, contributing so much to this training uh, as a family peer support specialist she has a lot of credibility in doing self-care so that you can help other people so thank you thanks everybody